Hello everybody, welcome back. In the last video we loaded our first sprite into a texture 2D variable and drew it to the screen. In this video we're going to start expanding our game engine to make game objects that have all this functionality. So if you think about it, we're doing all of this code where we have a vector 2 position and an image in our main game 1 class. And if we wanted to start adding on other enemies or other players, power-ups, all of those things would need their own Vector2 and Texture2D to represent their position and image. So we could, you know, copy and paste these same variables over and over a whole bunch of times, maybe even 100 times because usually games have a lot of objects in them. But that's not very efficient. And if you came from my Intro to Programming in C Sharp video series, we learned about inheritance and creating new classes that inherit data from other classes. So in this video we're going to start structuring our game engine by making game objects and every game object in our game will automatically have an image and a position. We'll also add some other variables that most game objects will need and we will create a player class that derives from the game object class. So let's jump right in here, and I'm going to right-click Game Engine, and go to Add, Class, and I'm going to call this class Game Object. I'll hit Add. First things first is notice the using statements up here do not have any X and A using statements. So we can go back to game1.cs and copy all of the using statements up here and then go back to gameobject.cs and replace these with the normal X and A ones here. Alright, and now we can make this class public because we want everyone to have access to the game object class. And inside this class we can start defining some variables that we think all game objects should have. So I'd say all game objects should have a texture 2D for their image. I use the protected keyword and if you don't remember what that means, that means all classes that derive from game object, so every class that is a game object will have access to image, but if you're not a game object you won't have access to it. Next I'll make a position and let's go ahead and make a color called draw color. Maybe we want to draw our sprites to be red like in the last video or any color we want. There's many different reasons to want to change colors sometimes. Let's also make a public float called scale. Now I'm going to go ahead and set it to 1F and then I'll say comma rotation equals 0F. So we're defining two floats in one line, a scale and rotation. When we're drawing our sprites, we can scale them up or down to be bigger or smaller, and sometimes that's useful for either some type of graphical effect. Let's say you're picking up a power-up, maybe you want it to scale down to scale away, or you want it to scale up to kind of make a dramatic effect on the screen. And then here we have rotation, and we can make our images rotate to the left or to the right, so maybe you'd want a power-up image to spin around to show that you can be picked up. Next we're going to make a float called Layer Depth, and I'm going to default that at 0.5F. And Layer Depth, that's a new concept we haven't talked about yet. If you've ever messed with Photoshop, in Photoshop you can have many different images on one file, and then in the Layer window you can rearrange the layers to decide which ones should draw in front or behind. So, so usually you want one thing to draw in the front and then the next thing draws behind that and then the next layer draws behind that. It's a similar concept here in our game engine. We're going to have a bunch of images drawing on the screen and sometimes we want certain objects to draw in front of other objects such as the player. We should always give importance to the player. And sometimes if we're drawing like a background image or something that's supposed to be behind everything, we would assign a different layer depth for that image. Next, 
I'd like to make a bool called active. This is usually a good idea to have because later on when you start to have a bunch of objects in your game, you'll want to turn off the objects that aren't currently being used. Or you could use this bool to turn objects off once they've been killed or destroyed. Let's say you're making a spaceship game where you blow up an enemy spaceship. You could turn the active bool to false so you stop updating the code and stop drawing it because it's no longer active in our game. Finally, I'd like to make a protected Vector2 called Center. And Vector2s, remember, are variables that hold two different floats. We can use these variables in a variety of situations. So before we were using a Vector2 to store an X and Y position to draw at, we can also use Vector2s to store directions, which direction in the X axis we're going, which direction in the Y axis. We could use a Vector2 to store image dimensions, like how wide and how tall something is. Here we're going to use one to store the center that we want to draw our image at. So remember, in the last video I said that the sprite was drawing in the top left corner. So whenever we set the position to be the center of the screen, the top left corner of the image was drawing at that center point. But with this variable, we could calculate the center of the sprite, which would be like right in the middle of his belly, and then that would be drawing at the center position of the screen. And we'll play around with that more later. But these are all the variables I'd like us to have. Let's also make an empty constructor. It's always a good practice to have an empty constructor because later on, if you ever um, save out all of your data and you have something automatically do that for you. A lot of times when you're serializing it's looking for an empty constructor to identify what type of object it is so it's a good idea to have that. And then I'd like to create some virtual functions. The first one here I'd like to be initialized because all objects should be initialized. Next, I'd like to make a virtual void load, and it will take in a content manager. All game objects will want to load in their own custom image, so we'll make a function here called load, and each game object will fill this out with their own image that they would like to load. So if we are an enemy calling the load function, it would load in the enemy sprite. If we are the player calling the load function, it would be loading in the player sprite. We will fill out these functions in later classes that derive or inherit from game object. We're just making a core class here that has all of these skeleton functions so later on we can just call update, load, and draw on all the objects in our game all at once because if everything is a game object we can easily access everything because everyone shares these functions. Next we'll make a virtual void update and I would actually like this to take in a list of game objects. A lot of times when we're updating the characters in our game, we'll need to access the other objects in our game to see if we've collided with an enemy or collided with a power-up. We typically want easy access to all the objects in our game. And later on, we'll make a list of game objects that has literally every single object in our game, and we can easily pass that around to all of these update functions. Next, I'd like to make a public virtual void draw, and that will take in a sprite match. Remember, in the last video, we called sprite batch begin and end, and then in the middle there, we called sprite batch dot draw one time. But as we start to expand our game and have a bunch of different objects, we'll just call draw on all the objects. And in here, we will say sprite batch dot draw our images for this game object. And finally, I'd like to make a private void called calculate center. And this will calculate the center of the image we've loaded in automatically for us. So whenever we load in an image, we'll just automatically call this function and calculate that center variable so it's up to date. 
So first things first, if the image is null, if we haven't loaded in an image, we will just immediately return from this function. Otherwise, center.x equals image dot width divided by two, and center dot y equals image dot height divided by two. So that's just taking the width, how wide our image that we loaded in is, and dividing it by two to get the center of the image on the x-axis, and then it's the same thing for the y. We'll take the height and then divide it by two. We can call this function in load, so we'll just say calculate center, and whenever we load in all of our game objects, this will be called for literally every single game object, so it'll take care of all the game objects for us. So now that we've made this base game object class, why don't we make a player class that inherits from game object? We'll basically recreate what we did yesterday and have that sprite draw on the screen and we'll take care of all of the input in the new update function for game objects. So let's go to Game Engine, right click, Add Class, and here I'm going to say player.cs. First things first is we have these old using statements that aren't using X and A. So let's go to game object or wherever has them and then control C and control V to replace them. Let's make the class public because we want everyone to have access to player. And here we will inherit from game object. So we'll automatically get all of the data in game object and we don't have to retype all that stuff all over again. I'd like to make an empty constructor and also I'd like to make a different type of constructor that takes in a vector2 called input position. And whenever we're creating a new player this is useful because we can just automatically assign the position to the position we want it to be starting on. Next, I'll say public override void initialize. And this will override the initialize function we started in game object. Whenever we call base.initialize, that will call the initialize function in game object or whatever class is directly below us. For now, we don't need to initialize anything, but I imagine we will. So that's a good thing to have that. Next, let's make public override load. For now, let's set our image just like we did before in the last video. We'll say image equals texture loader dot load sprite, and then we'll pass in the content manager because the texture loader class is using the content manager to load in a texture. Semicolon. And notice that when we call base dot load right here, that will automatically calculate the center of the image we just loaded in here. Okay. Next, let's say public override void update. And here I'd like to check the input just like we did in the last video. Let's make a helper function down here called private void check input. And I'm just going to go back to game1.cs and I'm going to take this code right here where we checked for input in the last video. I'm going to hit control C backspace to erase it and then in the check input function we'll put it here. In the update function we can just call check input and our player should be moving around just like in the last video but now we've structured it better and put it inside the player class. Now you're probably thinking, okay, so we have the player updating, but how do we make the player draw? And won't all of our game objects need to draw? And you are correct, all of our game objects will need to draw. So to implement the draw functionality, we'll go back to gameobject.cs, and down here in the draw function, 
we will call sprite batch dot draw but what's cool about this is since every single game object will have this draw function with the sprite batch dot draw we'll never need to type this code ever again okay because we're loading in images and setting those variables in each respective class like the player has his own image in his own position and his own scale for the image we can just draw all the information right here and every game object will automatically draw itself correctly so let's say sprite batch dot draw we're going to use I believe this parameter list right here because we have some more information to pass in to customize how we're drawing things we're going to start off by saying image for the texture 2D position for the vector 2 for the source rectangle we can pass in null for this right now let's not worry about that for the color we have a variable called draw color for the rotation we have a float called rotation for the origin we'll pass in vector 2.0 the origin is what defines where the sprite will be drawn at. So remember in the last video I talked about how the sprite was drawing at the top left corner. That would be vector 2.0 or 0, 0. We'll keep it the same for now. You could also pass in the center variable we defined earlier and this would make the sprite draw more centered. For now let's just keep it at vector 2.0 but feel free to change this later if you'd like. For scale we have a float that holds our scale so we can say scale just like that for sprite effects we can say sprite effects dot none because we're not worrying about that right now and then finally for layer depth we have a variable for layer depth we can pass in and finally semicolon at the end um, there's also a chance that we haven't loaded in the game objects image and then we try and call this function it would crash so let's do a quick error check and say if image is not equal to null and if active is true so if the game object is not active we wouldn't draw it so if it's true and we have an image loaded in we will go ahead and draw our game object so finally we need to go back to our game1.cs and clean this up a little bit we will keep this input.update function here so our input is up to date but we need to erase this actually we can just erase sprite batch dot draw because we're going to be calling draw for all of our game objects all at once and we'll also need to erase this image call here and up at the top erase image and position because now we have game objects that have all of that stuff stored in them for us. We do need a new variable though and that is we need a list of game objects and we'll go ahead and say new list here and this list will contain every single game object that's in our game so we can easily access all the objects in one variable here let's go down here to initialize and erase this position call here we're not doing that anymore and down here underneath the draw function we'll make a couple of helper functions the first one I'd like to make will be called public void load objects and this will basically go through all of our objects so we'll say for int i equals zero for as long as i is less than objects.count so this will take us through every single object in our objects list and here we're just going to say objects i dot initialize and then objects i dot load passing in the content manager with a capital C and we will call load objects whenever we load our level or load our game and we want to initialize all of the variables in every game object and then load in all of the assets or images that each game object needs that's very straightforward next I'd like to make a function called public void update objects <clears throat> and you can probably guess what this is going to do <laughs> I'm going to copy and paste 
that line we just wrote. And instead of calling initialize and load, I'm going to call update. And I'm going to pass in the list of objects that we defined earlier on. So now all of the game objects in our game have access to every other game object in our game. And like I said earlier, that's useful for detecting collisions and seeing where other game objects are located. And finally, I'm going to make a function called draw objects. And again, surprise, surprise, you can probably guess what I'm going to do here. I'm going to copy and paste. And then instead of calling update, I'm going to draw every single object in our objects list. And I'll pass in sprite batch right here. So hopefully you can see why we structured the game objects like we did and why that will be beneficial in the long term. If we have a bunch of enemies and a player, instead of typing sprite batch dot draw over and over and over again for every single one of those objects, we can just call objects i dot draw and it will automatically draw every single game object in our game and it will call that one sprite batch dot draw line that we wrote in game object dot cs and same goes for update and initializing and loading this will take care of all the game objects in one easy function I would like to make one more function up here called load level and in here we'll just load in some things to our object list so whatever we want in our level in our game we would load in here for now let's just say objects .add new player at new vector 2 640 360 semicolon at the end this is adding a player to our object list and specifically it's adding a player at the position of 640 360 so we should just like in the last video see our player in the center of the screen and after we've added all of the objects we want in our level we can just call load objects and that function will load all the objects for us automatically so hopefully you think this is pretty cool because this is going to save us a lot of work in the long term by setting things up like this let's go back up here and in the draw function we can just call draw objects right here and after we call sprite batch dot begin we will draw every single object in our game so sprite batch dot draw will be called a whole bunch of times and each image for the player and for all of our enemies and power-ups they will all be drawn right here sprite batch dot begin actually has some different parameter lists so it has some different things we can pass in I'd like to pass in a sprite sort mode called back to front and then we'll pass in a blend state called alpha blend don't worry too much about the blend state there are different blend states in FNA that you can pick that will make your images look a little different so later on when we get more things drawing maybe you can come back and play around with this to see how it makes things look different but for now the important thing is this right here the sprite sort mode back to front and remember earlier we defined the layer depth variable and this is basically saying hey sprite batch we want to order things from back to front and that means that when a object has the layer depth value of zero that will be drawn in the very front of the screen but when the layer depth value is one that object will be drawn in the very back of our scene so that variable goes from zero to one and if you're to do front to back that's the opposite so one would be I believe furthest to the screen and zero would be farthest back I always just use back to front because that makes sense to me back to front zero is the closest thing to the screen one is the farthest thing away alright now in the update function up here we can just call update objects and that will update every single object in our game and in load content we will call load level so we load everything we want in our level as soon as the game starts and I believe that's it people let's press F5 and see what happens
Hmm. Okay, that's interesting. I'm not seeing anything on the screen. And I think I have an idea for why that is. Do you have an idea of why maybe this isn't drawing? Let's debug this. This is a good debug exercise. Don't exit out of the screen. Okay, we're going to go back to Visual Studio and we're going to go to player.cs or no, I'm sorry, let's go to gameobject.cs because here we have that draw function. Let's set a breakpoint right on line 45 on the if. And notice it turns yellow, so Visual Studio has stopped the execution and we're currently on this line. We can hover over each variable and see what they are set to. So image, it has some things here, right? Image's name is Sprite, so it looks like the image has been correctly loaded, but our active is also set to true. Okay, I thought the active was going to say false. So what's the problem then? Oh, look at, look here. Draw color is zero, 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 zero. That means the draw color is invisible. <laughs> so that's why we're not seeing anything because it's completely transparent. It's zero, 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 and that's easily fixable. So let's remove this breakpoint here and press the stop button. And then up here where we defined draw color, let's just say draw color equals color dot white, and that will make the value 255, 255, 255, 255. So there's four different parts of a color. There's the red, green, blue, and alpha. All right. Let's press F5 again and see if that fixed it. Yeah, there we go. Yeah, expert debuggers over here. Check that out. And now we're moving around using WASD just like before. And I, I know at home you're probably thinking, wow, what a waste of 20 minutes or whatever. We just basically recreated everything we did in the last video. But I'm hoping you see why it was beneficial to restructure these things, okay? We just typed all of this base, sprite batch dot draw and all this base update functionality. We've done all this one time and literally all we have to do now when we want to make a new game object is just inherit from the game object class and then everything else is automatically taken care of. As soon as we put that object in our objects list, it will be updated, it will be drawn, and it will be loaded and initialized because of how we wrote those functions, okay? So in the long term, it's saving us a lot of work to structure things like this. So I'm going to exit out. And I'd say this is a good stopping point for today. We've basically restructured our engine and we're ready to start expanding things out, adding in more game objects, adding in more functionality, things like that. And we'll continue building out our engine in the next video. So I hope to see you all there. Peace out.